starts running a little over, so in order to, for Erin to have time to, she, Aaron's going to try and cut her presentation a little bit shorter to give you at least a little bit of time at the end for the audience participation. And I think we'll just pull up Aaron's slides. Erin, by the way, by way of credit, um, organized today's program. We talked to her a while ago, and she's been interested in these areas and forensics and, and computing for quite a long time, and it's proposed to be able to program on a topic like this today. So, Erin. So Mike realizes you're asking an attorney to cut her presentation short. <laughs> <laughs> and I know I've got a room full of people here who want to ask questions and there's a big cake in the back. So I would use my discretion and sort of blow through some of the slides. Uh, Julie and Natasha covered um, several of my topics really well, so bear with me uh, in that regard. Erin, um, one other thing, could you use the mic? Sure. Please? How's that? So, just want to start off by, by uh, get us all getting us all thinking about this notion of. Are, are folks familiar with the notion of you know when you try when you're swimming you try and stay above the water you end up floating or sinking I should say and when you want to sink you end up floating when you hold your breath you oftentimes lose it so what that's called is is the law of reversed efforts. And I think it resonates well in, in, with regard to this topic today, which is can we uh, balance information sharing and privacy? Because oftentimes our efforts to attain privacy, security, um, let's hold all of our data in, let's not share it, let's just you know keep it bounded, uh, end up uh, producing uh, privacy insecurity. So I want to talk to you t today about that. My presentation is, is compartmentalized in a couple ways. I, I want to talk um, initially about why we're in this situation that we're in. Why is there this tension between uh, data sharing and privacy? Talk a little bit about the, uh, the role of ethics in this regard. Uh, I'm going to do a quick little case study with rela that relates to um, some of the work that I do with some researchers at the university as it relates to network data sharing. I may go quickly through that because we've had a lot of good examples so far in terms of real world case studies. And then finally I'll just finish up with, okay, what are some solutions? How can we actually balance uh, information sharing and privacy? So it's not, a, it's not a yes or, it's not, you know, we can, we can share information but we can't have privacy. Uh, it's a yes and. We, we can share information and have privacy and it's all about, it's all about balancing. So we often hear that, uh, you know, especially after 9/11, hey, you know, let's suck it up here. If we want to be secure, you've got to, you've got to uh, relinquish some of your civil liberties. Um, it's not a zero-sum game. Um, they both can be achieved, and I think it's all about expectation management. Let's let's understand what this balancing means. I'm trying to fix my mic here. Okay. So the the best way that I've found to to illustrate this tension is. Um, in, in the battle between authentication or identification and, and free speech or um, anonymity. So when it comes to online banking or um, finding the digital crooks or um, preventing database breaches that have your credit card information or protecting your computers from malware, we all demand and want authentication. What do I mean by that authentication? We want to be able to, to, to map a carbon-based life form, a human being, with an activity that's occurring online, because we know when we're when we're dealing online, you know, it could be anybody behind the keyboard, and we really don't know that. So there's this 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 challenge of of um, identifying the person um, who's engaging in this activity. Now let's let's flip the switch. When it comes to online social networking or browsing about medical conditions, browsing the web in general, if you want to role play in Second Life, these are examples. You know, we, we, want to, we want our anonymity. We don't want to be identified. So this is a good example of the tension that goes on. And, and trying to strike that balance is, is quite challenging. So I think the heart of why this tension exists is this notion of reasonable expectation of privacy. It's an underpinning of the law. You know, we like to think of the law as being this very black and white thing very discreet, but in actuality the law is based on this notion of reasonableness and privacy with regard to the law is based on this notion of reasonable expectations of privacy and that's both a subjective and an objective measurement that, that courts and legislators and, and whatnot use. Um, and so I say it's this core underpinning of our control structure, our, we could think of our control structures as the laws, as the marketplace, 
and as our social norms and conventions. You know, what do we as a collective society think of is, is the right thing to do, is reasonable, so to speak. Um, and these, all these controlled structures are, uh, and forces are being um, challenged by the fast um, pace of technology development. So for instance, there's this notion of John Doe lawsuits. And what that is, is the best example is um, the recording industry will oftentimes file what's called John Doe lawsuits in order to disclose the identity of people who are engaging in peer-to-peer -peer file sharing because they want to catch people who are trading songs online, so to speak. Well, from a legal standpoint, um, yeah, the laws are clear in terms of what the government can disclose or, or can get and what legal process they need in order to get information from your service provider, but when it comes to civil, on the civil side, you know, there's a, there's a lot of gray areas there. So again, here's an example of a control structure of the law that's trying to, to deal with this notion of what's reasonable. Um, another con control structure, the, the whole business model of, of, of in the music industry has completely been blown out of the water by the internet because you know, the, the music industry is about distribution. Well, the internet has basically enabled everybody to be a distributor. So that's why the, the music industry is, is really struggling with that. It's a cat and mouse game. Um, I think everyone's familiar and can understand the notion of good guys versus bad guys. Hey, it's the hackers versus the good guys, the white hats versus the black hats for, for folks who are familiar with that, uh, that parlance. But now I think we're at this point in time where it's the good guys versus the good guys. And, and by that I mean you've got ordinary users who, who are engaging technologies such as Tor um, or anonymous remailers. Uh, cookie blocking and filtering, some of the things that Natasha talked about that are built into web browsers and tools made available to you as, as citizen consumers uh, because you've got businesses, legitimate businesses, who are engaging in things like predictive analytics, DPI, deep packet inspection, which is essentially they're looking at your traffic as it comes through your internet service provider. Um, they're engaging in, in behavioral targeted advertising as a result of looking at your um, your uh, traffic, and so this is what I mean. There's this good guy versus good guy uh, because there's a lot of uh, unclarity in terms of what can and, and can't be do from be done from a legal perspective. So our challenge is to redefine this notion of reasonable expectation of privacy in cyberspace. We have to think about this. So our 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 notions of what's reasonable, of how of what's a reasonable way to engage with with data, with anything in our, in our world. It was formulated in what I call meat space, in the physical world that we live in right now. And so with regard to data in the meat space, you know, think of photocopy machines. It's, it's hard to copy and it's relatively easy to delete. In other words, you know, you know you have to make a concerted effort to copy information. And, and when you want to destroy it, you know, it's pretty bounded. You know it's on a sheet of paper or, or a stack of files or whatnot. Now juxtapose that to the internet and, and cyberspace, it's, it's the complete opposite. It's trivial to copy and it's very hard to delete. We all know that. You can't, you know, email this forever, right? So it's a completely different paradigm shift in that regard. Um, technology automates in, in enabling automation though, it's simultaneously breaking down what I call speed bumps. These, these you know, manual processes that we defined our expectations of privacy around. So, so what we need to do from a technology perspective is make sure that we build in certain speed bumps as we're um, building this automation. And that's where things like what Natasha spoke about, getting domain experts involved to make sure that when we design these technologies, we design them with, with privacy enhancing controls in mind. So again, um, not to belabor the point, our, our speed of technology to development is, is gro grossly outpacing our reasonable expectation of privacy in terms of how slowly that changes. Think about this. Um, the telephone took 89 years to reach 150 million people. Television took 38 years to reach the same number of people. Cell phone took 14 years. iPod and Facebook, seven and five years respectively. I mean, that, that alone just illustrates how quickly technology is changing and becoming ubiquitous and, and pushing things forward quickly. And again, our, our laws, and I'm going to show you a diagram, um, uh, I think coming up in two slides, 
uh, that for the visual folks here may, may help you understand that a little bit more. So the result of, again, um, we have this changing notion of reasonable expectation of privacy. What's, what's the result? So the gap between our capabilities, and by that I mean what technology allows us to do. Technology allows us to peer-to-peer to -peer file share. I mean, pick any number of technolo any technology out there and, and you can envision what it allows us to do. It's incredible. And then there's that gap be between that and our expectations. And our expectations are formed by what the law says. Well, thou shalt do this, thou can't do that. Um, for example, can the recording industry um, send agents into my computer um, or get my uh, ISP records to uncover my identity just because I'm engaging in peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. Um, is your IPA, Internet Protocol Address, which is essentially the numbers associated with your computer, is that considered personally identifiable information? A question that we're struggling with. In Europe, they've come down on the, on the side of saying, yeah, IPA is considered personally identifiable information. In other words, it's, it, it's got the same status as your name. In Europe, U.S. we have not we have not gone down that route just yet. In the U.S. also we have a patchwork of laws uh, governing um, our privacy. Europe very different. They have this this um, underlying law that says, look, you own your information, and it's it's pretty encompassing. Here, our privacy laws are broken down along industry. We've got health information, we've got uh, banking and financial information and so on. And so that makes things even more difficult to try and map through that. And so, so what? Okay, great, we've got this confusion. We're trying to, to migrate and merge and evolve notion of expectation of privacy. Well, what we get is what I mentioned earlier. We've got conflicting rights. We've got good guys versus good guys. So here's a, here's a diagram, um, what, sort of what I mean. For folks who are not visually minded or aren't sort of scientific about this, you, you might not get it real quick, but think of this green curve as, uh, that's mapping Moore's Law, right? So that's the, that's the pace of our technology change. It's just exponential. It's increasing exponentially. And that exemplifies our capabilities, because as technology changes, you know, we're going to grasp onto what technology allows us to do. Now jump down to the bottom with the, the real, the, the line at the bottom that's sort of almost flatlining, and, and that represents our laws. Um, and it doesn't change quickly sometimes for good reason, for certain, because we, we need standards and we need that security. But, but the danger is the, is the delta between how quickly technology advances and how slowly the law does not advance. Because it's in that space that we undertake these activities that we in, are engaged in every single day. And the, the wider that gap grows, the more confusion grows about, hey, am I violating the law? And the more people you have violating the law, you, you create this society where there's a disrespect for the law, and then we're talking about a, a chaotic situation. And that's, you know, that's at the very extreme. But I, I hope that helps you sort of compartmentalize where what uh, the notion that I'm talking about here. So, what's the role of ethics? Um, you know, we've mentioned ethic, ethics a couple times. Um, I'll try and 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 put some meat behind that notion. So. Amidst this swirling situation where you know the law is not clear, we don't know what's reasonable, ethics provides a good grounding for us. Um, because the law is always going to change, and our sense of reasonableness is going to change, but ethical principles can be pretty static. Um, and that's, it, it's a good source of, of, um, of structure for us. So I just came back from, I, I was part of this uh, workshop put on by the Department of Homeland Security to develop ethical rules for um, obtaining and sharing and dealing with internet traffic data. And um, what we did was we, we based all of our effort on what's called the Belmont Report. Has anyone ever heard of the Belmont Report? Okay, awesome. That's three more people than I thought would know. <laughs> so Belmont Report um, was derived from the, the National Research Act of 74, and it basically was, it's, it sets forward the, the principles and guidelines for protecting human subjects who were involved. At that time, it was biomedical and behavioral research. Um, and it's also known as, as it, it uh, helped form what's called the common rule. So it, the important thing there is it, um, the reason it came about is because of uh, World War II concentration camp um, and the, uh, the research that was being done and the, and the abuses that were being done on concentration camp folks by doctors and researchers. 
um, and also other infamous experiments like the 1940 Tuskegee uh, syphilis study where uh, economically disadvantaged black men were basically infected and, and, and whatnot. So um, the purpose was that we, we need to develop standards for judging these people, for judging these activities. And so these have been, these principles have been applied in any number of situations and we took them and applied them in the network research. And so basically what these principles are in a nutshell to really sort of boil it down is respect for persons and that's applied in the notion of informed consent. Um, beneficence, which then is applied in this notion of, okay, you need to do cost-benefit analysis of, of the research of the activity you're involved in, and then the notion of the principle of justice, which is, you know, what, and that's applied by how you select your subjects, you know, are you just focusing on one um, specific disadvantaged group in your studies, or, you know, is it across the board? You don't want society to, to benefit um, as a, a, at the, to the detriment of a, a small segment of society. Um, so ethics applied, I'm going to blow through here, um, but these were, let me just see. So here's some of the real world um, uh, situations that network researchers are engaging in right now, and I'm, I'm working with them, like I said, on a, on a uh, consistent basis to help them deal with, like, what can I do from a research perspective? Because now they're, they're reaching a point in time where they're realizing that, look, my research is being impeded because I may be breaking the law. Um, so we have questions about botnet research. You know, is it legal, is it ethical for uh, network researchers to infiltrate botnets? How many people know what botnets are? Okay, so botnets in a nutshell are, you're probably all part of one if you don't realize it. Uh, basically when your computer gets compromised and it is owned and controlled by some criminal, and they use your computer as either a jumping off point to attack someone else or as just a way to obfuscate their own uh, um, identity and carrying, carrying out any number of, of uh, illegal activities. So can a researcher assume the position of a botnet and engage in those types of activities for purposes of understanding how it works so that we can create defense mechanisms. Well, yeah, it sounds great. We want to support the Robin Hoods, but by the letter of the law, oftentimes they are breaking the law. Unauthorized access into another computer system. There's no, it is a violation of the Federal Com uh, Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, and there's no intent requirement. So it doesn't matter that they're doing it for good purposes. They're breaking the law. So these are the types of questions that we deal with, and, and um, some of, I'll just blow through some of these. Um, can, can your ISP, for instance, can ISP share data with network researchers so that it can get a better understanding of, of infrastructure and whatnot? Um, most people in here would agree that it's reasonable. Yeah, sure, but again, under the electronic um, computer, the ECPA, um, uh, federal ECPA law, uh, basically ISPs are not allowed to share data with researchers. Broadly, now it, that can be uh, debated for sure. But again, these are issues of first impression that we're dealing with right now. So if the model's broken, things are changing. We're not sure what to do. What's going to work well? Uh, nothing will work, but everything might. I do like that for an answer. So again, I think just to sort of sum up what we're dealing with here, we're all three of of the speakers here tonight. Um, I think said in one way, shape, or form is what we need to do is co-evolve our technology, our policy, and our culture. Um, that's really where the solution lies. It, it, invol it involves getting folks from all those domains together uh, to deal with solutions that are reasonable. Hmm, interesting. Someone got in my computer and messed with my animations. Um, so, I know, here I was bragging on you guys for being botted, and I'm probably botted too. So, real quick case study, I'm gonna go quickly through this. Um, again, I'm working with network uh, researchers who deal on the security side and the network measurement side. So who is at risk when this, this data is shared? The individuals who are identified in the traffic, you know, your IP address may be in the traffic that's being shared. The researchers themselves, because they, they may be facing legal liability. Network providers, uh, your ISPs, they may be facing liability as well. 
Uh, the research organizations, they may have lost opportunity costs um, associated with you know, data that, that may be taken away, um, or if there's a privacy breach, they may lose funding. And society in general is at risk here because you know, we all bear the cost of misinformation um, and mistrust, and then we internalize you know, behavior. If we know Big Brother's watching over us, it's certainly gonna affect our browsing habits and whatnot. So that's what I mean by internalizing behaviors based on what you know, actions are occurring. So first, or this is the type of information that may be in this type of traffic that may be um, cause for concern. And I break it down into first order, identifying you know, your name, address, things like we can all understand, explicit, personally identifiable information. And then there's things like second order identifying information, your IP address, your machine um, access code, your um, host names. Things like your birth date and zip code, which in and of themselves may not seem too sensitive, but when combined uh, with first order or other second order data, they may be um, revealing of your identity. When do they pose a risk? You know, they can uh, impose a risk initially when they're exposed, or they can, you know, lie dormant. So here's the best way to uh, illustrate that: when your data is breached in a data breach, in a in a uh, is compromised in a data breach. Um, and there's a rich black market out there um, trading in your credit card information, in your name and social security number and whatnot. Um, that information may not be manifest in an e illegal use of that information, i.e., you know, someone's going to take your social and open up an account at the at the your local bank or apply for a loan in your name necessarily right away. That can lie dormant for weeks, months, years, and pop back up. That's where the real insidious uh, privacy danger is in, in my mind. So what are some of the other privacy risks? Um, there's this um, direct knowledge of non-public information, uh, health information <coughs> about yourself, sexual orientation, political affiliation, uh, criminal activity, who you associate with, what, what are your behaviors. Um, that's all potentially very sensitive information. And uh, as Natasha mentioned, it's this notion of correlating and, and linking information uh, with other public or private data. So you may have one piece of information that may not seem, seem too sensitive, but when it's linked, it becomes significant, a significant risk. So we went over public disclosure. Bear with me. I'm going to try and save us some time for questions, so I'm going to get through this. Okay, he's, he's about to pull the cane out on me in the back. Um, so some of the other risks, public disclosure, there can, just by sharing data, there can be accidental or, or, or malicious disclosure. Uh, just by having data that's been shared to you, you may be compelled by the government. Even though you don't want to give it up, by having it, you may be compelled. Again, government disclosure, this is what happened with the, the AT&T telecom situation where they released uh, the call data records um, to the NSA back in 2007. Again, that's a risk of sharing data. Uh, a misuse of profiles. Uh, network traffic, for instance, can have information about proprietary or, or security sensitive, part, sensitive parts of your network, so it can create a vulnerability for your electronic uh, infrastructure from a company perspective or even from a personal perspective. Um, that information can be vulnerable to um, misuse by legitimate businesses. For instance, as I mentioned before, targeted, targeted marketing advertising. You've got companies now who have been sued in class action lawsuits um, for doing just that. Uh, would you give permission to, some, to a company to basically tap into your ISP to look at all your traffic so that it can send you targeted ads? It's occurring. Again, inference misuse, re-identification, uh, de-anonymization. I think the, the takeaway there is, um, you know, companies, data providers are, fa are facing this tension. On one hand, you know, they're, they're pressured to extract value from your personal information. In other words, better and more efficiently connect supply and demand. So they're going to mine your data. On the other hand, there's all these laws that say, look, you've got to protect data. You know, California, in fact, like 
think we have 43 states now that say that have data protection laws. So there's this tension that, that companies are facing as well. So the harm of not sharing um, quickly in, in the space that I'm talking about, and I know we heard from Julie and, and Natasha about other spaces, spaces there. Um, so if we don't share data, we don't have empirical data for network science. What does that mean? We talk about critical infrastructure every day. We talk about homeland security all the time. And you know, our, our economic system, our banking and finance systems run on top of this uh, information infrastructure. If we don't know what's going on in that infrastructure, I mean, heck, it may be owned by the bad guys right now. There's this notion that, uh, who heard of the Conficker worm? It was all over the news. So, the, so one of the theories about Conficker was, well, basically what it was is it was a it was a command of all this you know millions of machines, and it was basically this underground Google. And what it's allowing, not was, what it's allowing the bad guys to do is basically run searches for specific information. Hey, I want banking information. And they can basically run their own darknet Google and find out information because they own all these millions of machines. A theory, I don't think it's too far off. Again, if we don't share data, empirical data about networks, we're not going to know what's really going on. Again, if we don't share data, uh, we can't counter cybercrime. We talked about botnets. Um, and obviously it's a huge threat in our society today. I'm going to jump to real quick to, well, how do we, um, how do we share data and, and maintain privacy? Um, authorization is key. Um, is there transparency? Are you allowing, you know, are you aware that companies are doing X, Y, and Z with your data and you are, are you authorizing it? Are you allowed to uh, are you privy to that information to authorize? Are they being transparent with what they're doing with their data? Natasha mentioned about Google and what they say they do versus what they really do. How, how do we know? Are they transparent with the data? Um, what, what's the purpose that you're collecting and sharing the data? And are you maintaining that purpose or are you repurposing it? It becomes a slippery slope. Um, is access to that data limited? Um, are the uses of that information limited? and are the collection and disclosure limited as well. This is just more of the same in terms of um, the solution space, and I apologize for, for blowing through this real quickly, but last slide here, what can we do to help balance? The government can help, FOSS can help balance the information sharing and privacy by fostering open public-private partnerships, incentivizing research using real data, use their buying power to incentivize a, a balancing here, um, and put teeth in, in laws um, that remediate privacy victims. In other words, allow private rights of action, allow people whose privacy are violated to sue, to obtain attorney's fees, because oftentimes if you can't get attorney's fees, you're not going to pursue a lawsuit. Uh, from an industry perspective, change the value structure rules. In other words, make privacy, building privacy into your products and your services a market differentiator. Give customers the transparency that they demand. Give customers choice as to how their information is used. Build in privacy controls. Don't use it as a band-aid. Bake it in. Citizens, what can we do to help strike the balance? We can vote with our feet. Don't buy the products or use the services that don't respect our privacy. Accept speed bumps. Look, you don't have to automate everything, really. Sometimes it's good to slow down, and you don't need all the bells and whistles in the world. I mean, do you need a phone? that bakes your bread and, and takes pictures, no. So, I mean, we really need to be conscious about things like that as well. And we have to accept some responsibility for our own security of our own systems. And Mike is kicking me off the stage right now, so thanks for your time.